Well, my name is Andy. I work in Eastern Canada for a company called Clone Crippen. And I'm current chair of the committee till the end of this year. So I'm just going to talk about consequence classification here. Within the ICOL bulletin, this is the consequence classification table. Some background for you. And some of you have heard this story before. Forgive me if you have, but uh, there's new people here. When the GISTM was being developed, they wanted to base their work on consequence classification and use consequences to inform uh, some of the guidance that's being offered in GISTM. They approached ICOLD uh, to help them develop that consequence classification. We did so. And so what you have in the back of the GISTM is actually a version of an ICOLD classification scheme that we developed in 2018 and 2019. We actually had a companion document with it, about two or three pages explaining how it should be used that didn't get included in the GISTM. And there were some things in there that kind of got morphed and warped around. So uh, it, it was okay, but it wasn't perfect. We had the opportunity when we were developing the bulletin to improve the classification scheme. And we did a number of things to make it better. If you care, I will have a slide at the very end that shows you explicitly what we changed from GISTM. But I'm not going to go there. At a high level, we cleaned up some of the environmental descriptions. One of those that was notorious that caused all kinds of grief in the GISTM was uh, if you have very high acid generation potential, it puts you into extreme. So I have a number of facilities in MEUR on. I've declared the classification of particular facility as significant. A dam safety review was done. The dam safety review team came in and said, it has acid generating tailings, therefore it must be extreme. And I said, no, it's significant because if it was to fail, it's gonna take two years for it to go acid. It's, we can clean it up, not the end of the world. They said, no, GISTM said, if you have very high acid generating potential tails, it's extreme. That's the kind of silliness that was being done if you look at the GISTM literally. So we've cleaned that up. Um, the numbers of people you'll see in the GISTM, there was 1,000 to 2,000 or 5,000 people. Those numbers are gone. GISTM, you would have seen the dollar values included here, greater than 100 million, greater than 10 million. Those are gone. And the reason for that is because in some jurisdictions, a $5 million loss has a much more significant impact than in other jurisdictions. So we've removed some of those quantifiable things, which I know people often look for, but we found them to be a problem. So the dam consequence classification supplements the national country frameworks. We're hoping that over time, the ICOL classification scheme will gain traction. We know we've got the GISTM one out there, and that's the money one. We understand that but we're hoping the ICOLD one will. So why do you do dam classification? Well, develop an understanding of the potential impacts of a proposed TSF to inform option selection and planning. So that's in the early stages. Inform the selection of design loading criteria. And that word inform is incredibly important. I'm gonna talk about that in a moment later in my presentation. Inform the dam safety stewardship and management programs provide transparency with respect to what could be the outcome of a dam failure and compare the TSS and owner's portfolio or if you're looking at options. That's why we do dam classification. What we write in the bulletin is that you should assume the mode is physically possible no matter how low the likelihood of failure is. This was a matter of debate when we were writing the bulletin. In Canada, what we do in Canada is we assume the dam fails and classify the dam. We don't care how it fails. We just assume it fails. But other countries in the world base the classification of physically possible failure modes. Australia had, had a screening exercise. Well, there was. And so there was a matter of debate about how you classify a dam, be it on physically possible failure modes or you assume it fails. The way we landed on this was if it's absolutely clear what the physically possible failure modes are, you can go down that path. But the basis and rationale for eliminating potential failure modes is not physically possible, must be rigorously developed and documented. 
And so what I have done in my practice is I've defaulted back to the Canadian practice of just assume the dam fails. But we keep the door open. If you want to go physically possible, you can and classify the dam that way. Now, I'm not touching credible failure modes in this discussion. OK, that's another two hour discussion. Um, it's beyond the scope here. And we stayed away from it at iCold. How many calls did we have on CFMs? 15? Heated, heated calls. And what we decided to do at iCold is stay away from that whole issue. And we did that intentionally because really the whole credible failure mode concept is an owner issue. It's a communication issue. It's not a technical issue. So the classification that we're talking about here is used to inform design and stewardship, not the outward communication. Now, do you need a dam breach analysis to get a classification? Just to show a hand, do you need a dam breach analysis to get to a classification? You think you need one? OK, let me rephrase the question. What is a dam breach analysis? Is a dam breach, OK, is a dam breach analysis automatically the detailed flow 2D or flow 3D analysis? Is that what we mean by dam breach analysis? No. Can I go on Google Earth and take a look at a dam that's 20 meters high and look at the downstream and say, kind of, this could happen? Yeah. That's kind of a dam breach analysis. The point is that every time you do a classification, you need some form of dam breach analysis. So let me ask the question again. Do you need? And I would declare a classification as being significant to high or whatever it may be, but I'm not sure, but I will err on the high side and hope a dam breach analysis will back me down. What I don't do is take the significant and come with a dam breach analysis that might increase you. You don't want that. So if you're not doing a detailed analysis, err on the high side or conservative side, and maybe your dam breach will either confirm what you've come up with or back you down. I think everybody in this room understands dam classification does not equal risk. I have many dams in my portfolio that are high, very high and extreme classification dams, but they are low risk. Very low probability of failure. Very low probability of failure. So we need and, and to me, I think when you say to someone, I have a dam that's classified as very high, but my risks are low or moderate, that tells you something. You've done all the right things. You've used the right criteria, the right construction, the right design, right operations to keep those risks low. Possibly because you have a, a, a high classification dam. So obviously dam consequence classification supports the design and operating decisions. And we're reducing the likelihood of failure. So there was a lot of debate about this in terms of uh, feedback from our reviewers. Uh, talking about how how can I cold accept classifying a dam as very high? And I'll just go back for a moment. To this table. Let's say we classified a dam as very high. That would be based on 10 to 100 people dying. Well, how can we at I cold countenance that? How can we at I cold say it is acceptable to kill 10 people? That's the type of discussions that were happening. And we're saying, no, 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 no. This is not a, a moral statement from ICOL that we're saying it's OK to kill 10 people. That is not it, right? What we're saying is that it's helping to inform your design criteria and your level of stewardship and tell you what the hazard is is being contained. But that does not mean we believe killing 10 people is acceptable. Is that accurate? You guys are part of those discussions. <laughs> now, I hate the term sunny day failure. I hate that term with passion. In Canada, it snows a lot, right? Does that mean it could only fail like on a Saturday afternoon when the sun is shining? No, it could fail when it's snowing or it could fail in the middle of the bloody night. So I pref much prefer the term fair weather failure. So you look at a fair weather failure condition when there's no flood happening and the dam fails, 
under, uh, under normal conditions. That might be through instability, internal erosion, maybe a seismic event. So I would really be happy if we as an industry move towards fair weather failure away from sunny day. But then you have the flood failure condition where you are looking at the consequences of failure if a flood is happening at the same time. So you have a flood happening, the downstream receivers are being filled, the rivers are flowing, bridges are being washed out, culverts are being washed out, and then you have your dam failing. What is the incremental effect? And in some cases, we will find that the classification from a flood failure is less than the classification from a fair weather failure. Another aspect that's important in the classification and thinking about it from emergency planning is warning. During a flood failure, there's often warning. There's time to get your incident command team in place. You can see it coming. You might know in two or three days that the dam is going to fail. Fair weather failure often is little warning. So it's very important that you look at both conditions. Now, often people will say, I will then take the maximum classification. I'll call that the classification of my facility or dam. And yeah, OK, fine, if you want to do that. But then then when you're talking about surveillance and surveillance is trying to guard against instability, internal erosion, those sort of things. Why would you take a flight classification to inform your surveillance when you're looking at instability? So I use fair weather classifications to inform my surveillance programs. So there's a lot of power behind this. A lot of people often will just pick one classification. I think there's value in it too. We now move into design criteria. The design criteria considers the dam consequence classification. We need to account for the potential impacts to owners. Now, you will hear from some of our esteemed colleagues about how we've got to stop following the water dam practice and tailings dams. Got to stop using water dam approaches and tailings dams. And what I believe they are saying is the water dams love the classification. Classification is high. There's their criteria. I am done. I've got a classification. I've got a criteria. I am done. What we are seeing in the mining industry is we've got to go beyond that and look at potential impacts to the owner. And we may need to select more stringent criteria. So we have these tables in our ICOL bulletin on flood design and seismic design. I'm not going to get into those in detail. But the point is that we need to use those as a base. And you need to sit down with the owner and you as engineer of record have to come to a determination of whether that criteria derived from these tables is adequate with respect to the risk tolerance that the owner is prepared to take. So in all of my projects, when I'm writing a design basis memorandum, I will say, here's the classification, here's the criteria stemming from it. However, through discussions with the owner, we have increased the criteria to X to be more consistent with their risk tolerance. Or the owner has reviewed this criteria in the context of their risk tolerance and have agreed to it in that context. Simply saying, here's the classification, here's the criteria, we're done, that, that's got to stop. Now, our friends at ICMM have gone to the point where they've ignored classification, and that's why. The good practice guide on tailings management has no discussion of classification in there, and it's all because of this issue. Trying to move people away from anchoring their design criteria to classification alone. So what they wrote here is recognizing that operators can follow the standard directly which they mean the GISTM, the GISTM had criteria based on classification. As an alternative, this guide proposes beginning the design process for new tailings facilities by assuming the need for extreme loading design criteria. Because while not the only factor involved, robust design with conservative criteria is supportive of preventing catastrophic failures. Selecting conservative criteria is consistent with the safety culture of the mining industry and the ultimate goal of preventing catastrophic failures. By beginning with extreme loading criteria, consequence classification 
of a credible failure is not necessary. Now, I don't agree with that. Okay, I'm just going to agree with a lot of it, but not all of it. I have many dams where I have no life safety issue downstream, and I'm quite happy living in about a, at the 1 in 2,500 seismic or one third between 1,000 and a PMF flood. I'm not driving all my dams to extreme like, I, like these guys are saying, but I'm following the approach that says I have a classification. I'm not just anchoring my design to the classification. I'm going beyond by considering the risks, potential impacts, and coming up with a plan that makes sense. That's what I'm trying to get across to you here. If you can take it to extreme all the time, great. But if you can't, it doesn't necessarily have to be. Now, if you have life safety issues, if there's a potential for one or two people to die, yeah, you've got to be in this world. The many of the dams I deal with aren't life safety dams. They're environmental consequences. So Attica talked about this, and we and Paul elaborated a bit. And Paul talked about this being targets, right? And coming back to your probabilistic assessment factor safety question, fill your boots. I mean, that's an that expression. Do do as much of that as you want. Okay. <laughs> oh. <laughs> but and it can complement things, which is fine. But what we're saying here is if you take uh, reasonably conservative parameters and reasonably conservative geometries, then the deterministic calculation of factor safety is adequate. If you want to go the probabilistic game, that's totally fine, right? You can, no harm in it. We're not discounting it. It's just we're not we're not saying you have to do it that way, okay? But this classification that if, if you have an extreme classification dam, you may wish to increase the criteria up to 1.6 or 1.7 for these peaks. You may wish to do that. And that's, we are asking the designers to think. We're asking the owners to think. In fact, there was a point in time where we weren't even putting bloody tables in this document. Because what happens is every single time you put a table in it, people grab the table and say, that's gospel, that's the way it has to be. We're asking our industry to think. Take these as targets, but if you've got extreme classification dams that could risk lots of people, 1.5 may not be where you think you should end up. End up. Does that make sense? Now, on the other hand, you're, um, pardon me. You're you're telling you're telling that we have to um, uh, uh, design risk based. Instead of fundamentally, yes, that's right. Yeah. Otherwise, the owner takes too much risk on uh, itself. He, he, they may eventually. For for what benefit? Yeah. Now, and the thing is, it's it, it's cost, it's alar, it's all those sort of things, right? But you know, taking a slope from two and a half to one to three to one, and punching a factor safety from one point five to one point seven may not be the end of the world. Like it's not, it may not be a huge cost increment to buy you that incremental risk reduction. So now on the other hand, um, you could go down and factor safety as well. And that's where this whole, like this risk informed design is a very broad term, but it's fundamentally what we're talking about here. If you have a 10 meter high dam with no real potential massive consequences downstream, and you're in a temporary situation where there's going to be three or four years of exposure before you do some things, maybe you go to 1.4. Maybe you've got good controls, not, not contractive materials. Again, think about it, build the case. And that's what that was, the risk informed 